Would you join us in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of your hearts, of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Did you know there are super Earths in the universe? It's true. In fact, super Earths may be some of the most common planets in the galaxy. Since 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope has discovered 4,000 exoplanets. 30% of them, or 1,200 of them, are called super Earths. And a few percent of those super Earths orbit within their own host star's habitable zone. A super Earth is an extrasolar planet with a mass higher than Earth's, but substantially lower than our solar system's ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, uh, in case you were wondering. In case you were unfamiliar with the term super Earth, it refers only to the mass of a planet, and so does not imply anything about the surface conditions or habitability. In general, super Earths are defined by their masses, and the term does not imply a certain temperature or composition or orbital property or habitability or environment. Again, you probably knew all that already. Through the Kepler Space Telescope, scientists have been, been discovering super-Earths for 28 years. It is clearer every day that there really are planets and life forms and places out in the universe somewhat like ours. And I, myself, am overjoyed to consider the possibility that Ewoks are real. In a year in which our lives and our planet have been defined by a very tiny coronavirus with spherical particles whose surface has unique projections, generally averaging only about 120 nanometers in diameter, the 1,200 plus super Earths certainly take us outside of ourselves, outside of our solar system, and into the ever-expanding universe. And that is a nice thought. As I sat reading about super-Earths and exploring the growing body of evidence for life far beyond our planet and solar system, I couldn't help but think about the texts today about the light of the world, whose birth, life, and very existence we are once again anticipating in the ancient scriptures and in our everyday lives. Although John's gospel lesson focuses on John's arrival, proclaiming the coming of what I'm gonna call our super light, I cannot help but wonder about the designs and choices that God has made to give us this super light. I have many questions about the light and our relationship to him. How was it that our God, who created the universe, the earth, all stars, the swirling clouds of hydrogen gas that tie together the solar system, the planets, the galaxies, that our God imagined, created, breathed design, and all the colors of light into this place that we call home, that our God did all of this, called it good, and then made a choice. After time had passed for a while, after making all these intricate patterns of the universe, our God made a choice to place in a bundle of human life, light, to place this bundle into the womb of a woman, to call her beloved, and to call him wonderful, counselor, everlasting father, prince of peace. How is it that our God chose to do all that? How could this be? How could we be so blessed to receive such a light in our lives? Moreover, how could we ever miss this blessing? How could we turn away from it and shrug it off? How could we act as though it doesn't matter or doesn't exist? How could we imagine that God, who had created all of this and took time to place light into this world, 
just really isn't that significant. And the super light that God has sent never existed or never came. Really? How could we, a sky full of children, God's stars in this infinite universe, whom God also created to adore the light, how could we miss this? The dance, the song, the breath, the delightful smile, the healing words, the hopeful presence. How could we miss the peace he brings? How could we not see and respond to the love in the womb of a teenage girl from Nazareth in whom the universe took form and for whom the ancient stars bowed down to a new light and the ancient harmonies of all the sounds, of all the spheres, of all the angels of glory, clapped their hands with joy, and we missed it? How could anyone on this planet miss this when we can find blue and beautiful sister planets spinning 600 light years or 22 million calendar years away and see that they are beautiful? John came as a witness to testify to the super light. He was not concerned about his own agenda, although clearly John knew who he was and knew what he believed and knew what was right and wrong. John was really concerned that people would see the light of God coming into this world like a neon arrow pointing, here he is. John stood in the darkness of his time pointing to the light. He wanted everyone who had been created in the image of God, and that means everyone who has ever lived in human history, he wanted everyone, every star in the full sky of God's children to see that God's goodness had been fulfilled right in front of their eyes. John was very clear that he himself was neither the Messiah nor the ever elusive prophet Elijah. You know, the one with chariots of fire. John was not even worthy to tie the sandal of the light. Even though John arrived like thunder in the desert, it was Jesus who would later open the book of the prophet Isaiah, unroll the scroll of Haftorah, and read with truth and authority, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It was Jesus who was the promise given to all nations. It was Jesus who would fulfill Isaiah's prophecy to build up from the ancient ruins, to build up and repair the former devastations, to bring the ruined cities back to life. It is Jesus that we would need more on this planet now than ever before, in which darkness too often blows away the light in our times. Jesus is the super light. Let's call him that for a little while and see how that feels. He's the super light of our lives and the super light of the universe. From the vast and distant beauty of super earths, I want to suggest something to you this week about light and love and life. I believe the same light of God which came into being at the foundation of the universe and found a place to shine from a feed trough in Bethlehem almost 20 or almost 2,020 years ago can be found shining in each of us and every single person that God creates. I believe that our God who loves us so much that God would give us God's super light in the person of Jesus Christ shines on us and in us and through us to others. I believe that each of us is created in the image of God. Each of us is a star in the sky full of God's children. So if we truly see each other 
as stars in the universe of God's creative design. Why is it that through acts of violence and anger and aggression and neglect, one child of God chooses to blow out the light in another child of God who was, who was created for love and life and light? Let me put it more simply. How is it, this, just this last nine days, that a deputy named Jason Mead could shoot a defenseless 23-year-old man named Casey Goodson Jr. to death at 12.15 in the afternoon on a Friday in Northland in Columbus, Ohio? One light blowing out the light in another. One light of God blowing out another light of God in this universe that we call home means one less star in the sky of God's creating. In the depths of my soul, I ache each day when I consider the injustice, the hatred, the anger running so deep in so many people that they act out of darkness within them and destroy the light of God in another human being. Like a candle in the wind, the light is blown out. It pains me deeply to consider such grievous actions against another. And it happens all too often. We have to find a way to nurture God's light inside of ourselves, so much so that we can lift up and celebrate and protect the life and the light of God inside every other person on this planet. We have to believe so much that the light of God is moving us to do and be great in this world, that we would see the greatness and goodness in every other human being. Here at First Church, we have artists all around us. At the Columbus College of Art and Design, at the Columbus Museum of Art, in our church, in our homes, they sit down in peace each day to write, to draw, to paint, to create. They need light within and light outside of themselves to create. They need visions of what is possible and what is good, what is promised to bring hope into this world. So here is my vision of promise and possibility. What if we chose to collect all of the guns in our city, all of the guns in our state, and we brought them and piled them in the social justice park next to the church, and we gave each of the gun owners who had turned in their weapons a box of crayons, a coloring book, a canvas, a palette of paints. What if the only sound that we heard in the universe of God's creating every day was the sound of music surrounding the sound of laughter and joy, surrounding the sound of crayons and paintbrushes and pencils on paper. The super light of God would come invited into such a place as this. John came to testify to the super light. We who are able to find super earths spinning far outside our solar system need to nurture and protect and support the light inside of each one of us and every one of our sisters and brothers on this planet. If we are to make peace, if we are to find peace, if we are to be peace in this world and this universe, which God created, each one of us needs to invite the super light of the world into our lives and be creative in the work that we do. Jesus Christ, the super light of the world, came to us as Jesus of Nazareth, born in a manger in Bethlehem, 
holy human, holy divine. He came to show us what it means to be created in the image of God and then to be creative with the image of God. He came to invite the super light of the world into each of our hearts and each of our lives and each of our homes for Christmas. It's that simple. Amen.